I would like to invite Michael Siligatze from Top Hat, Carlo Perez from Swift Medical, Daniel Eberhardt from Coho, Claudio Rojas from Hurt Capital, and Mike Lee from Fundica and R&D Partners on stage. Mike, I'll hand it over to you as the moderator. Where's Mike? Mike's in the back. Please give them all a big hand. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. I'm going to keep my mic. Mike can keep the one over there. There you go. All right. Thank you, Rick. It's good. Um, so very excited to be here today. We have some uh, some great companies here that have raised some big rounds, um, and some that have in invested in them as well. Um, so to start with, I'd like to everyone to introduce themselves. So perhaps you could start. Yeah, sure. Uh, so thanks for having us. Uh, my name is Carlo Perez. I'm the founder and CEO of Swift Medical. Uh, you want to get into companies now, or yeah? So maybe just talk about yourself a little bit. What what kind of round you raised? Yeah, sure. So uh, so we just closed a, a 12 million dollar, or just under 12 million dollar round from uh, Data Collective, uh, based out of Palo Alto. Uh, our organization builds uh, what is the world's leading digital wound care management platform. Um, just a little bit on wound care really quickly. Uh, there are more people in the world with, uh, with chronic wounds than with breast cancer, colon cancer, lung cancer, and, and leukemia combined. So we build a platform that allows uh, users to, uh, doctors and nurses to automatically measure and assess those wounds using their smartphones. Uh, we deploy that to the cloud and allow those customers to manage risk, cost, and compliance. So um, about 10 times uh, the number of installs as the next competitor over the last year, and uh, excited to do a, a whole bunch more. All right, thanks, Carlos. Mike? Great. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Mike Siligatza. I'm the founder and CEO of Top Hat. Um, high level, uh, Top Hat uh, creates educational software for uh, professors and students in universities. If you've ever had the frustration of uh, paying too much for an out-of-date, uh, dull textbook or sitting in class and uh, trying to stay awake as the professor kind of talked at you for, uh, for a while, uh, Top Hat creates a digital interactive learning platform that replaces those uh, uh, tools and experiences with the uh, more interactive uh, alternatives. Uh, we've got users now at pretty much every large university in uh, North America and growing pretty fast. Um, in terms of capital, we've uh, raised a total of around 40 uh, million in capital. The last round was uh, 22 million led by uh, Union Square Ventures. All right, thanks, Mike. Claudio? Claudio Rojas, Managing Director at Hurt Capital. We are a founder-centric investment and venture capital platform. What that means is that we invest in extraordinary founders some of which are here, we might have to talk a little bit more closely. And um, we also invest in um, other VCs as a VC LP. And so we're currently looking at one fund that's based in Canada that, that's raising just under 200 million. Uh, they're extraordinary in terms of their global reach and uh, they have very interesting companies in their portfolio. Dan? Hey everyone, uh, my name is Daniel. I'm the CEO and co-founder of a company called Coho. And so we are arguably the sort of leading digital challenger bank in Canada. Uh, how it works is, is we partner with the bank who holds the money and, and we kind of do everything else. Uh, it's very much an account optimized around simplicity, transparency, helping people save and, and kind of get insights into their spending. Uh, we have raised $16 million to date uh, and we should, we'll probably get into this, but in our most recent round, we raised six million uh, as opposed to doing a series B just because we didn't want to take on the dilution right now uh, and we can dive into some of those details. All right. Thanks, Daniel. So, so Carlo, in terms of uh, your fundraising history, how did, how did the last round was a large one. Um, has it, you know, how's it kind of progressed with time, your, your fundraising? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, how's it progressed over time? It would be uh, the 10-year history of that, or maybe just for this company. But uh, uh, we started out with a, I guess a fairly small uh, angel round, about 400K from friends and family, uh, about a, a year into the company or so. Uh, okay. from, uh, from then on, we uh, were lucky enough to meet the, the folks at Real Ventures and, and Relay uh, and Mars, um, as mm -hmm. well as BDC, so we put together a round with them, uh, and that was about uh, 1.2 uh, for our seed round. So what are the dates on these, approximately? Uh, those were, uh, actually all of them were almost exactly a year apart, okay. um, whether we wanted that to be the case or not. Okay. Yeah, so, so about a year apart from each of those, and then uh, running to our next round with, uh, led by Data Collective and then uh, participating heavily by uh, both Relay and uh, Real Ventures as well, uh, as well as BDC. Um, that, that was, again, uh, about a year later right. after that. And Carla, was it much harder raising that big round or was it actually easier because you'd already raised rounds? Uh, 
I don't know if easy and fundraising should ever be put into the same uh, <laughs> sentence together. Never easy, um, okay. But, uh, but uh, so I would say it was um, easy in one way, just simply probably because of experience. I think that once you kind of know what is expected of you as someone who's raising funds, how to present that, uh, I think that that's you know, one piece that makes it easier. Uh, the part that probably really made it, I guess, easier, quote unquote, uh, was just the team that we had behind it. I think that we had uh, finally gotten to a place where we had you know, leadership um, and buy-in from a group of folk that had lived through a really hard you know, set of milestones through the seed round, could take control, let me completely step back for, uh, for well, it sounds small, but you know, three months and all the time leading up to that. Uh, and, uh, and really uh, we had, a, really we had you know, through our investors, especially real, um, just an entire team of folk there that were helping us connect out into the environment, uh, make introductions, and you know propel us you know well past what might be you know initial first meetings with associates and all the way to the partner level and then eventually the partner meeting level. So we had a lot of support, uh, mm -hmm. and I think that's what again you know made it easier. I, it's, I can keep air quoting. That <laughs> okay. I don't know what else to do with it. <laughs> okay, interesting story. How yeah. about how about yourself, Danny? Yeah. What's your the kind of history of the fundraising? Yeah, so we, I mean, our, our first round, so it took us kind of two years to get to market, because it turns mm -hmm. out there's a lot of regulation in banking. Um, and so our first round was everything from like $150,000 VC checks to $25,000 angel checks. So that's like a really scrappy selling the dream. This is what we want to do. We've de-risked the dream. And that was like a few hundred thousand dollars, that one, or is that? Yeah, so that, that was about one million oh, was one our million. first okay. round. Um, mm -hmm. And then raised a, a 1.6 after that. And I, I think the Series A does get easier in some ways because uh, because you do have more experience, but also it's a little bit more concrete. Like when you're when you're pitching a seed round, depending on your time to market and everything like that, it's very much sort of abstract. And this is where we're going, and this is what we think about the market, and this is our thesis. When you get to a Series A, it's it, it, you can't hide the metrics. You know, this is the growth, this is the trajectory, this is the adoption, and so the conversation becomes much narrower. Um, but it's never easy to raise funds. It's, right. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and yourself, Mike? Uh, yeah, so I, I guess uh, I will say, I mean, our Series C, which was uh, about a year ago, uh, was significantly easier uh, than our previous uh, rounds. Um, uh, our, the hardest round we ever had to raise was our angel round. I mean, the, the one thing is this was back in 2010, uh, where I mean, effectively there really wasn't a startup ecosystem in, in Toronto or, or Canada. Um, and uh, that round took us about eight months to raise for $200,000. I mean, it was just absolutely brutal. Um, uh, whereas uh, the, uh, the latest round that we raised, um, I mean, end to end was probably a month and a half. Uh, and uh, you know, we were fortunate to have a, a number of offers uh, in front of us. Uh, the big difference between those early days uh, and uh, you know, today is First, there's more availability of capital, uh, mm -hmm. so that's that's essential. Uh, and U.S. Uh, investors, things are getting pretty expensive in the Bay Area and New York, uh, and so there's a lot more interest in, in Canada, which I think is great. Uh, uh, and then the other difference is when you're raising on, you know, real metrics, you know, revenues, growth, um, it becomes almost less of a conversation. You just kind of show up with a spreadsheet, and then they say, all right, that means you're worth X dollars. There's some variance in the numbers, but it's pretty close. Uh, Right. and you can get it done uh, pretty quickly. Right. And Claudio, kind of looking at it from a, another point of view in terms of the way you invest, small rounds, big rounds, and, and your kind of history as well. Yeah, so uh, we've done really well investing in the public markets over the last 10 years, investing in founder-run companies. And a decade ago, that was revolutionary. If you look at some of the largest companies in the world now, those were our big bets. And we've done very well concentrating our investments in really great companies and then holding for the long term. The, what makes it a little bit easier, to Mike's point, about later rounds is that there are a lot more data points. So it increases a level of certainty. And you can, you can do a lot more, I would say, due diligence on your thesis. Um, there's data pushing in both directions. And at that point, you ideally already have a relationship with the founding team, either directly or through the other investors that are already on their cap table. And then that makes it a lot easier because there's a, there's a greater level of credibility and uh, greater visibility into where the company might go. So, so Claudio, to go a little further on that, so you kind of very much pride yourself on kind of data-driven research and data-driven investments. 
how does that work? I, I guess in public markets, there's probably a lot more financial data available. Um, what are the kind of important metrics, say, for an entrepreneur raising a round in a, in a tech world? Right. Tech? And so when we say data points, you can also think of it as proof points. It's not necessarily data. Right. Um, our approach in the capital market, so we've outperformed Berkshire Hathaway over the last 10 years. For those of you that know, that's Warren Buffett's fund, uh, one of the greatest investors in the world. And we've done that by focusing in areas where other people aren't and assuming that others have done their due diligence. And then when we have our thesis in an area that perhaps the market hasn't really developed their thinking, then we do our due diligence using the numbers. And so the financials are more of a due diligence exercise than a lead exercise. Right. And with that in mind, when founders are raising capital, and I think this applies to all levels of firms, you always want to lead with the vision of what you're trying to build, where you want to go, and then the numbers, uh, then at that point put forward the numbers that support that, that show that you're on that trajectory. Right. And I guess a, a really good point too I see, and I see frustration with some entrepreneurs is that you really have to find investors that their thesis is your thesis, right? They're kind of, they see what you're doing. I'm in fintech, I would really see a next generation banks coming out here. Like they have to almost have that in their mind before and, and to fit in, right? And if that's not the case, you probably just go to the next. Would that, would that be a fair statement? The capital pools are deep enough and there are enough um, VCs uh, across the terrain that you'd like, you want to build, you want to raise capital or receive resources. I think of capital as a resource from an investor that, that you click with or from an investment team that you click with that sees where you're going, that has the same kind of vision or visibility into the future that you do. And you need that cultural fit because inevitably you're going to experience some kind of nonlinear growth pattern and you want an investor that's inside the room with you, not outside, you know, judging you. Right, right. Mike, in terms of biggest mistake you've made, the, you know, in, in fundraising, what's, okay, you kind of look back and hopefully laugh today, um, but, you know, as a, or if uh, it's not a biggest, the biggest mistake, mistake biggest. That we've, uh, that we've made in, in yeah, fundraising? Yeah, in, in fundraising, um, yeah. Um, or looking at the other way, the biggest success, if that's easier. Like, what, what was a yeah, really good thing to do? Yeah, I would say, well, I, I'll talk about both. So one of the things that we've done uh, that's worked for us, I'll say, um, you know, we've been always focused on, on ensuring we've got pretty good revenues. You know, we, from day one, I know that's not appropriate for, you know, if you're running maybe a consumer business, it's tough to, to ramp up. Uh, but for most B2B businesses, you can usually uh, focus on the revenue side. Uh, so our philosophy, our approach has generally been raise around of fu funding, but then within 12 months, 12 to 18 months max, you need to be at cash flow break even. Um, uh, and that's kind of, you know, I would say that that's really worked well for us. It's allowed us to A, control when we need to fundraise, because then mm -hmm. we're never in this sort of squeeze where suddenly we need to go out to market when we're, uh, we're not ready. Um, and, uh, and it's allowed us to get, uh, you know, better terms as a result of it and, you know, be more selective about the investors. So, uh, I would say, I'll talk maybe about the biggest mistakes that I've seen others uh, make. Um, uh, one of the most common mistakes I see, and this is true whether, you know, people are raising a, an angel round or an A round or a B round or a C round, is, first of all, they go too early. You know, they go out before they have any kind of significant traction and then they burn a lot of their bridges. Because frequently, if you go to a, a pitch meeting and it doesn't go well, or you're kind of written off as, you know, as a no, uh, you're, you're likely not gonna get another shot. Uh, um, uh, actually, I guess th that's something that we have done is, <laughs> in terms of mistakes. Uh, you know, before honing our pitch, we'll go to the, you know, the number one investor that we really want to fund us. Uh, and usually the first, you know, five or 10 times you you do your pitch, uh, it doesn't, uh, it's not as smooth as you, you want it to be. Uh, it's not sort of battle tested. Um, uh, so the advice there is I would say, uh, you know, make a list of the top firms that you want to work with and then the ones that are maybe the less, the lower priority go to those first so that you can uh, get some feedback. Okay. Carlo, in terms of mistakes? Uh, yeah, I can kind of riff off of a little bit of what Mike said there. Um, if you want to ask for a list of mistakes, I can post a 10-page blog um, <laughs> a little bit later if you'd like. Um, but uh, it, it, part, part of that was, uh, I'll kind of extend that answer and kind of, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of maybe uh, pressure in uh, the circuit to go out and do the schmooze game. I absolutely agree that, you know, do make sure that you've kind of got um, what you want to say in your general story straight before you go to that top invest that you're looking for. 
um, because you really, like, first impressions really, really do matter. Um, and I would say kind of to that, in our earlier rounds, when we talked about um, eight months, uh, a year to raise that, you know, what seems like a small 200 or 400K in, in our case, um, uh, that, that's very, very real. And I think that, um, you know, as you get into later rounds, people start talking about processes and running a process. And I think that if we had been, um, really what that is is, you know, doing all of your homework, as much of that homework as you can. Uh, our failing has been doing a ton of homework and realizing that the amount of homework that we did was probably three times less than the amount that we needed to do in terms of targeting the funds, in terms of understanding how much dry powder is left, in terms of uh, understanding and qualifying the thesis that those investors had, and then showing up and having conversations that are, oh, you really like consumer health care instead of enterprise. And then, uh, you know, there's a bit of a match, but not enough. So you can okay. spend a lot, of t uh, a lot of time spinning in that way. Um, so setting up a really strong process, something that we really you know, honed in on this, this, this past round. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's, you know, that the, you know, So kind of do your happen. homework and, and be ready. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, right, okay. Yeah. Daniel, other thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, uh, I've made all those mistakes. Like, I, I don't, I think those are probably the most common mistakes that, that entrepreneurs make, and uh, it, it really is a process. Um, I think the one thing that I, uh, uh, one thing that I wish I would have done differently is got more industry expertise on my cap table and had the more uh, bought in earlier in the game. Like, the I didn't really know what I was doing when I started this company, uh, and, and the notion that an uh, angel who writes a twenty-five or fifty or seventy-five thousand dollar check is going to add value mm -hmm. is just not realistic, you know. And so I think we could have accelerated our trajectory if we would have been a little bit more thoughtful in terms of not just acquiring the right investors, but uh, making sure that they were sunk in had a sunk cost in the company and, and bought in. Right. Okay. And Claudio, from the investor point of view, what do you see entrepreneurs making mistakes? when they approach you? Yeah, le if there's not a pre-established relationship leading with the pitch deck or leading with the financial metrics in a really you know, hard sell style, you know, cold email or cold phone call, um, in all cases, we're betting on the founders. And it's important to, to kind of move down the path gradually, build the relationship, talk about what you're working on. And to, to an earlier point, um, you don't want, once you pitch, it becomes very formal. It becomes, we're looking at it through the business lens and we're gonna judge you in a harsher light. But if you're just in the process of building the relationship, it gives, it gives you a little bit more buffer, a little bit more leeway. And generally the Canadian venture capital community, we wanna help. Uh, we come to events like this and, and events like this are very important to help the ecosystem advance. Uh, so reach out to people that you have a good bond with or good connection with, build a relationship. And then even if they don't invest in you directly, they'll be able to kind of clear the path and give you some warm, warm leads into their other VC colleagues. And just to add, add a thought on some of those conversations that we had early in the, in the game, it was conversations like that and then quite pointedly never pitching but asking them what does it look like to de-risk this business, right? right. And, and what does that trajectory look like? And then when you have a, con a conversation three or six months down the road, you have a relationship and you also have accountability and you have some proof of execution in understanding what they think to be the key drivers of your business. Right, right. And Mike, to kind of go with what you had before, to kind of get the yin-yang on this, some of these, let's say, big investors you want to speak with, should you actually start that relationship earlier on without pitching to them? Does that, does that, that I mean, follow along the same way? Yeah, absolutely. I would say that's, that's the best way to do it. Uh, for all of our rounds, yeah, every single uh, venture round, we had spoken to the investor for a minimum of two years. Uh, prior right. to the investment actually taking place. That's not to say that we didn't do the uh, typical sort of, you know, pitch and partner meeting and that whole process, um, you know, from start to finish during the fundraising process, but the ones that we ended up going with in every case were investors that we had known for years leading into, uh, leading into fundraise. Right, right. Yeah, I would, I would almost just add to that too in terms of building relationship and kind of riffing off what um, you were saying about bringing on, you know, investors in lower ticket sizes. Uh, is just making sure as as you put together that board, um, recognizing that observers make a huge, huge impact on your business, no matter whether they have a vote or not. I mean, there's no real vote uh, when you're a seed stage or you know a, a, an angel stage company. Everyone at that table will be able to use their voice to influence the direction of the business. Um, and I think that has a lot to do with, in terms of mistakes, making sure that you really uh, date the, you know, those investors understand who they are uh, and get to kind of 
you know, whether you're really aligned on your vision. Right. So Charlie, would you actually invite potential investors as advisors or advisory board before actually going to pitch to them, or is that maybe a little bit too much? Yeah, uh, I don't know if that's, uh, I think, so I, I had this uh, fundamental thesis there, no matter what, what uh, positive or negative comments one might have about uh, VCs, uh, at the end of the day, fundamentally, the ones that I've met really want to help. And I think that um, when you kind of start digging into that and turn it into a win-win, uh, so my, my sense of engagement is whether that's formal advisory or not, to me, the right time to engage is I've got my story straight enough that you know I'm not asking you know should I what do you think about AI powered toilet paper you know which might actually be a good idea but that's you know that's not the stage you're going at you're going at you know I, I really believe in this this is where I think it can go what do you think I can do how do, how can I make this defensible um, and uh, taking that advice and timing that so that you can show that you are truly coachable show that you have truly listened. Uh, and whether that listening turns into, no, you were completely wrong about that. At least you've proven that um, along this long you know, pathway of building a relationship, um, there's a conversation to be had, and you're the type of person that you can work with. Because ultimately, you're, you're working with this person for years and years and years. Um, and I think more than anything else, when you talk about investing in founders, I, I feel like that's what they're looking for. Someone who can really be coachable, really work with, has an opinion, isn't a pushover, but uh, is still moldable and malleable. Uh, in a direction that's positive for all the shareholders. Right. Um, okay, so in terms of uh, takeaways for entrepreneurs here, what are kind of the, the, the bigger points you would kind of message you like to say if you're going out to raise a round, be it small or big, that kind of, we've talked about a few kind of takeaways, do your homework, you know, approach them early, but don't pitch to them until you're ready. Um, you know, I think a few other things, but maybe to kind of summarize here, Daniel, we'll, we'll go through each one of you. Sure. So, so I think um, I, I would say two things. Uh, one, like VCs have a job to deploy capital, and a lot of founders don't realize that, and I didn't realize that that early in the process. Like, there is a handful of great companies in in Canada or within their investment thesis, and they have a job to find those companies. So, if you are really good and you have done your homework, like the the power dynamic should not be what a lot of people perceive it to be, which is founders like scrapping for capital from VC. Like VCs are looking for great companies to deploy capital, and if they don't deploy that capital, they're not doing their job. And so it's really important that, that f we, we kind of get rid of the scarcity mindset that, that I think a lot of early stage uh, founders approach. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that's a big one. I think especially early days, one of the things that we did, and you, we wrote this blog post called How We Used 1K to Raise 1 Million, and it's how we thought about de-risking our cost of acquisition. Um, but we actually like spent a lot of time being really transparent about de-risking our cost of acquisition, which is a primary driver of the business. And then we even actually built a calculator to like show the the standard deviations to ultimately like really de-risk how we thought about acquisition. And so I think for because we did that, it put us as a bit of an outlier when we thought about going to raise capital. And so right. I think anything you can do early stage to be an outlier and to vindicate somebody put it, placing a bet on you is, is really important. Right, and to go with that relationship, one thing I find interesting is how do you actually meet the VCs? So you mentioned, you know, real introduced you to some for some rounds, some of your, to get that relationship kind of balanced, you know, like a dating relationship, yeah. that first step is pretty important. And if you keep, you know, I see some entrepreneurs and they're like, I've called them five times, <laughs> you know, right away, it's like that guy trying to get the date, and it's like it's not going to happen. You've already, you're, it's done, right? You're not even going to be able to pitch now. So, how do you, how do you start that? Uh, or, or some tricks, maybe, how to do it. Yeah, I mean, you would probably know what works. But I'll, I'll pass it to you. I think you would know what works better than I do. You probably see all, all kinds so, of. Uh, on the point of you know calling five times, people are busy, and and so there are some some people that have reached out that I mean to get back to them, and so if they if they follow up a little bit too quickly, it can it can get a little bit annoying. Um, even if it's someone that I really do want to help out. So, you know, sometimes give it a little bit of breathing room. When I was on the entrepreneurial side and I was doing cold calls, my approach would be you meet them, you follow up, you know, within a couple of days and you follow up within a couple of weeks if, if you don't get some traction. At that point, give it maybe three or four weeks and then periodically, you know, no more than you know, every three months. And I don't know if you guys would agree with that. Yeah, if you're not getting a response. If you're getting a response, then obviously you can pick it up. Yeah, yeah I, I was actually almost going to list that as my number one mistake. I, I would say that, uh, so I'm, I'm really bad at uh, dating, I don't tell my wife that, uh, but, uh, you know, 
as an aside story, like we could my, do another panel on that my, one. <laughs> yeah, well, my MO was to go on a date with her and write her like a two-page email the night, uh, that night. So that was not, uh, I think, what uh, is, is really, there, there, is a, there is a bit of a game to it, um, but it's not so much of a, a, a game as we're playing this because we need to try and steal away funds from a, from, from a VC or something like that. It is, how do I build uh, a genuine relationship with someone? Um, how do I not, you know, ping them so much that you know they, they start to get annoyed with me? And, and I think that where uh, where we started to find uh, our cadence around it was, um, you know, going out, doing some really informal meetings, almost never even really talking about the business. As soon as you start talking numbers in your business, you go into a system and a spreadsheet, and those numbers are going to be tracked to the next time that you meet. So, uh, you know, make sure that you're you're kind of you know really in line with you know, where where you're actually at, um, and then. Um, uh, for us, where uh, where it started to really turn into that conversation was uh, as we started our process. You know, just really okay. Well, you know, we're we're about to go, and kind of laying that message. Hey, you may be busy right now. We're about to get hit the road in about six weeks. You know, here's the teaser deck. If if you're interested, let me know, uh, and just kind of backing off and, and just letting it letting it be. And it, it may be the right timing. It may just be they're involved in another huge deal that's coming up, and that's why they're not responding. So you just gotta, I think it was, uh, uh, the last thing I'll say about this, uh, it was with um, our, our current uh, uh, backers, our, our data collective and Scott Barclay out of Palo Alto. And I remember <laughs> after that meeting, uh, uh, it, was a, it was a real good meeting. And um, one of those like, oh my God, this, this person really matches our vision so tightly. This is, this is the person I wanna take money from. And I remember leaving that and uh, Sam Hafar, who was really helping us coach through his <laughs> partner at Real Ventures, um, I called him up, he said, how'd it go? And I said, oh, it was amazing, I, I love what they do, and this is exactly you know, AI, machine vision. And he said, all right, don't email them. And I said, what? <laughs> and, because you know, my, my MO is to just follow up right away. I was like, I, I need to talk to this person. Uh, and I remember sitting there on a Sunday night, this is three days after I'd flown back from the Valley, I'm sitting there kind of curled up on the floor, and my wife is saying, just don't email, because she understands this, this game. <laughs> right, right. Um, and she says, just don't, just play it cool. Um, you know, I was following his Twitter feed, and he doesn't know this story yet, but he was following his Twitter feed, seeing which conferences he was at. But just play it cool, they're busy, um, know that you have a good story, know that that will come out if you're a really good business, and you know, just, just, just run your process and believe in the process. Right, right. Yeah, and to okay. push back on that, you do want to follow up at the right junctures yes, because yeah. you don't want them to forget about you. Right. right. Yeah, and, and we do appreciate the follow up from time to time. But it's nice to have that balance, right? You want it, it's just like dating, I guess, right? I love the dating analogy. You got to, yeah, there's yeah, a bit yeah. of a sweet spot there, and on either side, you're going to crash and burn. Right. It's right. like two days for the dating world. It's like you meet them, and then it's, it's got to be two days. <laughs> I know, I know. So, Daniel, thanks. So, kind of summarizing, you're kind of like, get that kind of you know, I guess, equals in a room type of feeling, and at the same time kind of show your outlier value for your company. Something special, it's not just, okay, another deck of another company, so. Yeah, I, I would actually just add one more, hopefully it's not too much of a tangent, but um, if you go to the Valley, Valley companies are five times more likely to raise debt than you are in Canada. And so for whatever reason, there's connotations around debt capital, but like long term, if you have a healthy revenue business, and that's not us, because we're a capital intensive business, but, uh, Debt is so, so much cheaper than, than equity capital. And I think that's something that the Canadian market still needs to get more comfortable with mm -hmm. um, because it just doesn't really happen in Canada or it has the wrong connotations, but it can be enormously uh, much more affordable than, than right. equity. Yeah, it's cheaper, right? Yeah. Yeah. Easier too. On that. What, what we like about debt, so our whole thesis is called founder centrism. If you search online, uh, we published uh, some of this research with Os the University of Oxford last year. Um, it, if you're able to maintain control over your company as a founder, there's a lot more that you can do. And debt capital is non-dilutive, and, and as long as you don't raise too much, leverage can also be a dangerous game. But if you can strike that right balance, um, my advice would be focus on, focus on it growing the company as quickly as you can. Don't worry too much about diluting yourself. And then, of course, there are these other avenues if you're getting to that point where, where you've raised perhaps a, a good enough amount, and then you can raise debt capital to right, maintain right. control over that vision. All right, so just to kind of... Can I make a comment? Uh, I, I just want to add something to the... Sure. Uh, like, certainly there's some analogies around dating and, uh, <laughs> you know, making sure that you're, you strike that balance of not looking too interested. I, I, I would just say that 
the reality is if a VC is interested, you're not going to have to follow up. They're going to be chasing you to put money in your company. Uh, the way to know if a VC is interested is to look down in your hands. If you've got a term sheet there, that means they're interested. If you don't have a term sheet there, they're not interested. VCs will never tell you no, or very rarely they'll tell you no. Uh, they'll tell you later, or they'll tell you when somebody else leads. Or they have lots of creative ways of saying no. Uh, so don't focus too much. If someone didn't give you a term sheet within a week or two of that, uh, of that first meeting, uh, they're probably not going to invest. So it means your pitch sucks, your something's up with your company, just go figure that out. Don't try to figure out how to play the mind games. That really, you know, that, that doesn't, that only goes so far. I have a question. Did that change as you moved towards your C round? Was that more obvious or more applicable to your C round than it was to, let's say, your? It's probably maybe less applicable for angel investing maybe somewhat. Um, for any venture round, I would say that's, that's been my experience. Uh, it's, you know, if they're interested, like I said, you're not going to have to follow up. Basically, at the end of the meeting, they're going to set up the next meeting. Like that's, it usually moves really fast. Right, okay. So just to kind of conclude, Carlo, in terms of big takeaway or kind of summary message you want to leave for entrepreneurs? Uh, yeah, may, maybe uh, kind of in line with what I was saying earlier, I think that um, the, the road is, is hard and it's long, and I think that um, you know, it may get easier or 